Simply put, we cannot survive without water. How we protect and manage our most precious resource is about understanding the complex hydrological systems, the interconnections of our world, and how we can apply GIS to the challenges around us. So our first journey takes us to the Southwest Florida Water Management District. With over 20,000 miles of coastline, 30,000 lakes, and 11,000 miles of streams and rivers, water is the defining feature of Florida. For almost 30 years, the district has been applying geography and GIS to the challenges of protecting and managing the surface waters and the aquifers, monitoring water quality, mitigating flood risk, and ensuring a clean and safe water supply for everyone. So please welcome from the Southwest Florida Water Management District, Steve Dix, Lee Warshawski, and Chris, Chris Kaufman. Now, before they get started, I want to share with you a short story about the first time we met with Steve and his team. It was an incredible mix of people. We met with the wise mentors that were sharing their knowledge, the innovators that were bringing change into the organization, and the scientists with the burning desires of understanding. It was, it is truly an inspirational story. With that, Steve, the stage is yours. Thank you, John. Florida is the third most populated state in the country, and balancing competition between agriculture, development, and the environment is what the district does. Beginning in 1987, we created and implemented a classic enterprise GIS strategy to help, help us meet our mission. Over the last several years, we've had to rebuild our strategy from the ground up to help us meet new water management challenges. This new strategy has resulted in GIS being integrated to all of our scientific and business processes and systems. What we're going to now do is show you how we use this strategy and give you some ideas of how you too can change the way you do GIS. The district manages the area's water supply, 80% of which comes from the Florida aquifer. This subsurface, form subsurface limestone formation can be over 1,000 feet thick. Now, welcome to Plant City. This area east of Tampa Bay is the second largest producer of winter strawberries in the country and is a really good example of where we have competition between farmers and homeowners for the same water resource. In 2010, over 750 wells went dry and 140 sinkholes formed because they were pumping groundwater to protect strawberries during a record freeze event. What we can do now is look at how the impact of this pumping on the water levels in the aquifer. From the aquifer's perspective, we can see as water levels drop, the homeowner's wells go dry. This leaves them without water, and it also in many cases can damage their pumps. What the district was able to do is use these analyses to develop new surface or new water use and well construction rules that allow the farmers to protect their valuable strawberries and to ensure that homeowners have a dependable water source. Let's turn our attention to flooding. Florida has four times the number of flood insurance policies as any other state in the country. The district is responsible for mapping flood plains in the area, and we use Arc Hydro to help us enhance our surface water modeling activities and to help us meet our flood protection responsibilities. The process starts with the creation of a digital elevation model from the district's LIDAR data. From this elevation model, we can outline surface water basins. It shows where rain collects during stormwater events, during rain events. We then map how water flows between these basins. And because Florida is so flat, we also have to include subsurface information such as pipes and stormwater drains in our analysis. The combination of the surface water and the subsurface information provides us with a complete picture of how water flows through this system. All of this information is then fed over into surface water models, 
and the outputs all come back into Arc Hydro, where we can then map the floodplains. In the past, sometimes, when, often when there was flooding events, about all we could do is say, I'm sorry, but you built the floodplain. We're in a much better position now. Developers are able to use our models to go ahead and, and identify where to place homes so they're not in the flood zones that are identified on this map in red. Now, Lee is going to go ahead and show us how we use this and other information to support our surface water permitting efforts. Thank you, Steve. The goal of environmental resource permitting is to uh, reduce flooding hazards and to ensure that new development does not negatively impact water quality and natural systems. We're modifying our permitting process by bringing pre-application review to non-traditional GIS users through web maps. The process begins when an applicant wishes to construct a new development. The pre-app viewer is used for a quick assessment of the proposed permit and provides access to authoritative district data. The applicant draws their boundary on the map. The boundary location is used to identify factors that would make it difficult to issue the permit. Factors such as, is it in a floodplain? Are there wetlands on or near the property? And are there wells on the property that the applicant was previously unaware of? The applicant is now ready to apply for their permit using the district's e-permitting system. Using information from the pre-application review, the applicant submits their final permit boundary, initiating an automated workflow. Meet the water management information system, the district's system of record. Now I know this looks like a boring form, but looks can be deceiving because behind these screens represents the complete integration of GIS across the district. This is the most powerful map we have. It's our permitting map, our process map, our science map. It is driven by geography and drives our business. It is the infrastructure vital to our success. The public also has access to this data through the district's online apps, such as the General Permit Viewer app. Now, as a district scientist, Chris is leading the way in using jazz technologies to enhance our envi environmental monitoring efforts. Chris? Permitting in the previous subdivision helped safeguard the Tampa Bay estuary from a new source of pollution. In the 1980s, the district started to improve a severely polluted Tampa Bay. Our team constructed stormwater treatment and habitat restoration projects like this one. At the mouth of the bay, we also constructed a project that increased water circulation and had a positive effect on seagrass. Seagrass meadows serve as protection and feeding grounds for recreationally important fish and are a food source for sea turtles and manatees. To monitor the success of our efforts, the district began a broad-scale seagrass mapping program. We use seagrass as a bioindicator of bay health. Its sensitivity to water quality causes it to act like a canary in a coal mine. We manually delineate seagrass distinctive signatures from aerial imagery, optimized to see through the water column. As the bay's water quality improved over time, our 30-year mapping program documented documented that seagrass increased in Tampa Bay over time. Let me show you here. So you can see as the map is changing, we saw our increases. Uh, Tampa Bay is now as clean and as clear as it was in the 1950s. And our 2014 map is showing that the bay contains record-breaking expanses of seagrass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sure. 30 miles north, we also map seagrass in the Springs Coast region of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this area is a challenge. We've, we're, we're collecting data in up to 20 miles offshore in nearly 30 feet of water. It also has very high biodiversity, including not only seagrass, but algae, corals, and sponges. As we advance our science agenda at the district, we're evaluating satellite imagery and the automation of our workflows to include feature extraction for seagrasses. We can quickly segment this Airbus image and perform a rapid classification of its unique spectral signatures. The results show that our uh, two different shoreline types, salt marsh and mangrove, were delineated, as well as our critical seagrass resources. 
Image segmentation of remotely sensed data is one way for us to increase our efficiencies in monitoring the Springs Coast region. Now let's move inland, and we'll look at a new, another natural systems monitoring effort using full motion video. This is a traditional vegetation map of Flatford Swamp. This swamp is in distress. The surrounding agricultural uses direct too much water to the area, effectively drowning the vegetation and allowing invasive plants to take over. So our problem here is the interior of the swamp is completely inaccessible from the ground. This hinders our ability to collect detailed species-level data. As an alternative to field work, we've gotten creative and are now collecting high-definition video. We've collected video from two different platforms. The top is our fixed-wing video in red, and our helicopter video is in yellow. So the map pane that you're seeing as we watch the video is tracking our aircrafts and is showing the video frames. Now, this is where it gets really exciting, and I tend to nerd out over the plant data. Full motion video is allowing us to delineate and draw our vegetation features in the video display, and they will show in our map pane. So here, we're going to delineate an invasive vine, Ligodium, so that we can later track and control it. We're also interested in identifying trees killed by a beetle-transmitted fungus, and we're tracking other important tree species. Now, full motion video is a game changer. It's giving us a spatially referenced bird's eye view so that we can create powerful maps. Now back to you, Steve. Thanks, Chris. I've seen this a million times, and it's always impressive. <laughs> what you've seen today shows the pervasive nature of GIS in our district. Increasingly, we're using ArcGIS Online to drive our business. We use it to communicate flooding information to our homeowners. We monitor the efficiency and effectiveness of our permitting processes. And we show our science in action protecting our springs. I spent almost three decades at the Water Management District implementing GIS to serve and support our community. As I reach the end of this career, and I look to the next generation of GIS professionals, I have to ask myself the question, does the district have what it needs to continue to support and protect Florida's water resources for future generations in Florida? The answer to this question I firmly believe is yes, because we've implemented and integrated GIS into everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Lee, and Chris. It was a powerful presentation about how the district integrates geography throughout their business processes, how they apply science to their decision making, and their relentless mission to monitor progress at every step.